Um, well, okay, thank you for having me. As the uh, name implies of this uh, talk, uh, the, uh, the Arctic is uh, really changing pretty fast. And what I'll try to do is uh, review a few points of these change and why these changes uh, are occurring. I'd like to acknowledge the kind and continued support of the National Science Foundation and NASA for this research. So to set the stage here, we know that over the past century, global average temperatures have risen by maybe about 0.7 degrees C. We know that some of the most extreme warm years have occurred in the past decade. And the new data that just came out is showing that 2005 set a new record for the warmest temperatures that we've seen since records began. And of course, that warming is widely believed to be in part due to greenhouse gas loading. Second point here is over the past several decades, warming and environmental change has been especially pronounced in the Arctic. Third, the climate models predict that the effects of this greenhouse gas loading will be amplified in the Arctic. And finally, so then we ask the question, are we really seeing the first signs of this so-called Arctic amplification of greenhouse warming? So let's go first, look at that point three. Why should the changes be especially pronounced in the Arctic? The primary reason involves so-called climate feedbacks, particularly the feedback associated with the Arctic's snow and ice cover. If we look at the Arctic, we see that for most of the year, it has a lot of snow and ice. This is snow cover over the land areas. Of course, there's this big Greenland ice sheet sitting out there. But also very important, especially important, is the presence of the Arctic's sea ice cover. This is a floating ice cover which covers much of the Arctic Ocean. It waxes and wanes with the seasons. In winter, it covers about 15 million square miles, a lot of real estate. In, win in summer, it shrinks to about half that size, but it's still a large area. Now, of course, that snow and ice is very reflective. It's very white. That means that it reflects much of the solar energy that hits it right back into space. Well, the idea is that if you start to warm up the climate a little bit, say with greenhouse gases, what happens is some of that highly reflective snow and ice cover starts to melt. That means you start to expose darker underlying surfaces. Over land, this would be things like you know darker tundra or darker shrub, darker shrub vegetation. Over the ocean, we're talking about exchanging sea ice with a dark open ocean, which can absorb a great deal of solar energy. If we look at the reflectivity or albedo of sea ice, it might be about 0.7. That means 70% of that solar radiation is reflected right back up. Dark open water might have an albedo of 0.08, so 8%, so it's much, much less. So the idea is if we warm up the climate a little, we start to melt some of that snow and ice, we start to expose those darker surfaces. They absorb more of the sun's energy, which means that the system warms up a little bit more. And so then you can melt more of this snow and ice, a darker surface now. You warm the climate up even more. So you basically you have a feedback effect that an initial perturbation, in this case greenhouse gases, is amplified by processes internal to the system. And here we're talking about uh, this albedo feedback. It's another factor involved in the Arctic. One of them is the strong stability of the atmosphere, which tends to focus the heating near the surface. If you're out here in Utah in the winter, you know you have these strong temperature inversions in the winter. You can build up pollutions and things like that in that lower boundary layer near the surface. Well, by the same token in the Arctic, the strongly stable atmosphere, inversions, that is where temperature actually increases with height, actually tends to focus the heating near the surface. So that's another reason why the Arctic would be especially sensitive to change. So then the question, you know, are we seeing the first signs of Arctic amplification? So just uh, uh, going back a little bit, and this is repeating a little bit what we heard before, uh, let's just look at sort of the global problem first. Of course, this is the thing we're talking about, the rise in carbon dioxide. This is the well-known Keeling curve. This is based on carbon uh, dioxide measurements at uh, Mauna Loa, Hawaii. Pre-industrial levels were down here at about 280, okay? Uh, now we're at about uh, 380 right now, and of course, as we've already heard, uh, that's the highest we've seen anywhere in at least the past 600,000 years. That that change is due to us is incontrovertible. There are many fingerprints that tells us that that rise is us. Uh, one of them is the carbon-14 content of the atmosphere. 
idea. If you're burning fossil fuels, well, fossil fuels have no carbon-14 in them, essentially. So if we're burning fossil fuels, and that's the cause for this, we should be seeing carbon-14 content in the atmosphere decreasing. We do. If we're burning fossil fuels, it's a combustion process. We ought to see oxygen in the atmosphere decreasing through time. In fact, we do. Don't worry, there's still plenty to breathe right now. Uh, but just the point is that it is basically incontrovertible that this recent rise that we've seen uh, is us. So again, before we get to the Arctic, again, just to review a bit of what's happening in terms of global temperature changes. This is from an analysis at NOAA. This extends from 1880, and this particular one goes for about 2003, I believe it is. And what we're looking is at global temperature anomalies, or temperature anomalies uh, relative to a reference period. In this case, I believe it's a 1951 to 1980 reference period. So we're looking at differences in temperature relative to that base period. So this, com this top one here combines the global land and ocean areas. So we're taking measurements over land from regular places where we measure it, and we're also looking at uh, measures of uh, oceanic sea surface temperature. And of course, you see this continual rise from rather low or, or negative anomalies out to about 1930, and then we see this strong rise thereafter. So certainly, we're having a global warming. Now, uh, the pr point is, is that this is not just limited to the lands and the oceans. This one on the bottom shows the same pattern, but just based on the land stations. This one here shows the pattern based on ocean sea surface temperatures. You see the oceans are warming and the lands are warming. Why are the oceans warming less than the land? This goes back to some of the stuff we heard about earlier today uh, with Dr. Uh, Curry, that uh, the oceans have a great deal of thermal inertia. Okay? so that uh, a lot of that heat in the ocean is being held in a mixed layer right now, so you don't see it as strongly expressed in terms of the sea surface temperature, while the land areas are much more fast responders. Um, also, it's not just the northern hemisphere, and it's not just the southern hemisphere that is participating in this warming. So here's that global temperature record again, strongly rising through the period, but this breaks it down for the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. So the point of the matter here is that this is truly a global signal. So what's happening in the Arctic? Lots of interesting things are happening into the Arctic. First thing I want to touch, about, touch on is changes in permafrost. So what is permafrost? Permafrost is perennially frozen ground. And much of the northern hemisphere, northern land areas, are underlain by permafrost. This permafrost can be up to 600 meters deep in areas of Siberia, actually some areas locally even more than that, 1,000 meters in thickness of permafrost. This map here shows the distribution of permafrost in the northern hemisphere. Anything in the colors is where there is permafrost. Now there's different types of permafrost. This continuous permafrost, and that is, we're saying if we had a square kilometer area, we'd be saying that all of that area was underlain by permafrost. We also have what's called discontinuous permafrost in this more blue color. That is where it's more patchy. And then sporadic permafrost where it's even more patchy, for example. We see that most of the Arctic is underlain by continuous or discontinuous permafrost. Out here, Rocky Mountains, we see this isolated patches of permafrost. For example, even near my home of Boulder, Colorado, I'm only 20 miles away, we can find isolated patches of permafrost. Tibetan Plateau, out here, another area with this permafrost. Well, what we're starting to see in the Arctic is that this permafrost is starting to warm and degrade. Uh, it's of concern from a number of ways. Uh, one is it's going to have strong impacts on the hydrologic systems. Arctic rivers behave different than rivers in mid-latitudes because you've got this impermeable permafrost layer. If you pour water on the top into a watershed in the Arctic, basically it runs, like, run, runs off just like it was on a linoleum floor because you've got this permafrost, which is an impermeable barrier, impermeable barrier different than mid-latitude systems. So it has strong effects on the hydrology but certainly on the sort of plants that can live there, for example. The existence of permafrost largely dictates just what can grow there. One of the things we're seeing is in large areas of the Arctic now, tundra vegetation is starting to be replaced by shrub vegetation. Now, part of that is just a direct effect of the warming, you know, a warmer climate. You can support different types of plants. But also it relates back to some of these changes in the permafrost. 
This plot here I thought was very interesting from re very recent work that we've been doing, which is looking at changes in the active layer of permafrost based on a series of soil temperature data from Russia, from Siberian Russia. Now, what is the active layer? Well, if you think about permafrost, what you've got is this perennially frozen ground. But in a seasonal sense, there's a thaw layer that develops. We get into spring and summer, and there's a thaw layer that develops at the surface. The depth of that thaw layer increases through the summer. And then that thaw layer freezes up again uh, as we get towards autumn and winter. Well, changes in the active layer thickness is something we can measure fairly well because we've got some fairly extensive soil temperature data from Russia. And this plot here is just showing active layer changes in permafrost in Siberian Russia is based on about 100 different stations, going from 1955 to about the year 2002 in this one. And you can see here, here's year to year to year, certainly some variability in that system, but here's your linear trend line, and you can see we've really been starting to increase the depth of that thaw layer. So this is, a, I think, a fairly strong indicator of some of the changes we're seeing in the Arctic's permafrost system. Other impacts of permafrost. Uh, well, the, there's a lot of thinking out there that changes in permafrost may induce additional climate feedbacks. One idea, if we have we, one area, uh, one aspect of permafrost is that one develops seasonal thaw lakes. But as the permafrost starts to degrade, these thaw lakes start to turn more boggy, and you get a lot more anaerobic activity. So the thinking is, okay, thawing permafrost and associated vegetation changes, meaning more methane released to the atmosphere. In other words, a positive feedback on the climate. Now certainly the major greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide, but molecule for molecule, methane is, I believe, something like 20 times a more efficient greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, much smaller concentrations, okay? But it is saying that these changes in permafrost in the Arctic may be involved in additional climate feedbacks. What are some other changes we've been seeing in the Arctic? Changes in the extent of melt of the Greenland ice sheet. Dr. Curry, again, touched on some of this in his earlier talk. Let's just look at this bottom right figure. This is showing the areas in the orange and red are showing the parts of the Greenland ice sheet that underwent surface melt in the year 2005. Turns out that the year 2005 was the most surface melt we'd ever seen in Greenland. But the extent of the surface melt in Greenland seems to be going up with time. Uh, rather variable, certainly. Large variations from year to year. See that low on there? You can associate that actually with the eruption of Mount Pinatubo that put a lot of aerosols and other stuff into the atmosphere, caused a temporary cooling. A lot of variability, general upward trend. Where do we get this from? This is from satellite data. We can measure this sort of stuff rather accurately uh, with Earth orbiting, polar orbiting satellites. So we see that we're having this general increase. Now certainly in terms of a regional impact on climate, what we're doing here by melting that is starting to reduce that albedo. Okay. So regionally, we're seeing something that might may be able to associate with the initiation of some of these feedbacks we talked about. But there's a lot more to it than this. In terms of changes in sea level rise, in terms of the effects of melting glaciers on sea level, we know that there is a small contribution right now, which is likely going to grow. But the, the paradigm regarding these larger ice sheets, like Greenland, is that the change would be slow. In other words, year after year, we might melt a little bit more. But in terms of changes on sea level, we're talking about things like potential influences of, uh, say, a meter or two of sea level, a few meters of sea level in millennia. But the thinking is starting to shift now that this may be wrong, that maybe we're talking about something like as much as, oh, say, half a meter in 100 years, something like that. And, and this is, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of speculation here still. It's sort of emerging thinking. Why, okay? Well, basically, it turns out that that melt isn't just surface melt that flows into the ocean. Some of that melt water seems to be percolating down to the base of the glaciers that drain that ice sheet and literally lubricating the base of these glaciers so that they can slide more easily into the Arctic Ocean. And we've seen evidence for this in a number of what might be called galloping glaciers. Uh, the most extreme case is for Jakobshavn Glacier on western Greenland. Uh, 
Jakob's Alvin Glacier in the past five years or so has basically doubled its rate of discharge into the Arctic Ocean. In other words, it's, it's sliding at about twice the rate it was, like even five years ago. Uh, and so what it's starting to do is put a lot of icebergs and things like this into the Arctic Ocean. At the same time that the velocity of this glacier has increased, arguably by this basal lubrication, as we call it, the front of this, ice, of, of, of this uh, outlet glacier has actually shrunk back. In other words, what's happening is we're getting a lot of flow from the right to the left, an enhanced flow, but at the same time, the front of this um, glacier has actually been drawing back quickly through large capping events. Okay? So basically what it's telling us is that maybe our thinking about the stability of the ice sheet is not quite right. Okay? They may be a little less stable than we think. This is a very, very active area of research right now, and there's a number of very new papers that have come out on this. So this is certainly interesting, but from my perspective, uh, and it's maybe my bias, um, I've always been extremely fascinated by what is going on regarding the Arctic's sea ice cover. So I mentioned this is a sea ice cover. It's about one to four meters thick, floating ice, and it covers a large part of the Arctic Ocean. Now, these four panels on the top are showing the extent of Arctic sea ice for September's of the past four years, 2002, 2003, 2004, and 2005. September tends to be the seasonal minimum in the amount of sea ice that you get in the Arctic. The amount of sea ice you have uh, in September is a good indicator of the overall health of that ice cover. Now, first of all, a few things. See that gray area? That's the polar hole, which is not covered by satellites, okay? So that's a little problem there. So don't worry about that little bullseye. That's not uh, reality. That's we just don't have the data there, okay? Uh, but now, anything in the colors is where there was sea ice in the past four years. Now, within that, you see differences in colors, reds and blues. Those relate to the variations in the ice concentration. In other words, if we take a square kilometer of ice, and if it was all ice, we'd say the concentration was 100%. If half of that was ice, half of that was open ocean water, concentration would be 50%. So what I'm showing here is anomalies in the ice concentration relative to a 20-year mean. Don't worry about that too much. The one you want to worry about or look about is this red line that I've got surrounding each of these figures here. That red line is basically where in an average September the sea ice ought to be. Okay? So it ought to be extended about out here, for example, in 2002. But no, you can see we've had some rather significant losses. Uh, now, this figure on the bottom here is showing the time series of September sea ice extent since 1979 when we've been able to accurately measure it. So what I'm showing on the y-axis here is the extent in millions of square kilometers. On the x-axis here is year starting in 1979, going through 2005. Clearly, a lot of ups and downs in that system, a variable system. It's not a uniform decline. Here's the best fit trend line, and you can see it is rather large. Turns out it's about 8% per decade. That's a large number. Now, let's look at 2005. Here's 2005 sticking out like a sore thumb. Now, let's compare September ice in 2005 with what we ought to have on average September. Well, if we compare those numbers in terms of the amount of ice we lost in 2005 relative to the average conditions in September, that equates to roughly the size of the state of Alaska, area-wise. Okay. Now, even our president knows that Texas is a large state. <laughs> well, we can make a similar comparison, and we can say, compared to average conditions, the amount of ice we lost in 2005 is roughly twice the size of the state of Texas. So the point is, it's a lot of real estate that we're talking about. This figure on the right is showing how it evolves seasonally. Now, this, ice, this amount of sea ice, we tend to grow it in the autumn and winter, and then we lose it in the spring and summer as, this climate, as the system warms in, in summer. So what I'm showing here is the extent of sea ice we've got on the y-axis by time, and here I'm going from June through September. So this is how it should be looking in an average year. In other words, we're in June here through July and August. We lose the extent of sea ice, and it bottoms out around the second week of September. 
then we start to grow it back again the next winter. So that's what we ought to see, okay? That's sort of an average condition. These four lines in the bottom are what we've seen in the past four years, okay? So you can really see a remarkable difference there. Here's 2005, standing out like a sore thumb. I'm going to go on record right now as saying we're probably going to have very little sea ice this next summer, basically because the ice has not recovered this winter. If we look at every, uh, every month uh, since the last minimum, September 2005, we'd had record minima in sea ice. In other words, this last January was the least sea ice we've ever seen compared to all Januaries. So it seems to me it might be hard for that ice to recover. And basically, we're talking about this feedback process. What appears to be happening right now is that we are starting to reach a tipping point. We have started to melt out this sea ice. We're getting rid of more and more of it every summer. Well, what happens now is we expose these darker open ocean areas. Those darker open ocean areas then absorb a lot more of the sun's solar energy. So the oceans heat up. Well, now you've got all this heat in the ocean mixed layer. That means that come autumn, it's hard to grow the ice back again. So that come spring now, you're left with less and thinner ice, which means you can melt it out even more easily the next summer. So a feedback effect. It appears that that process start, is starting to take hold. So basically, the fact that we had so little ice this last year is pretty much guaranteeing that we're not going to have much ice this year. So it appears that we're kind of reaching this tipping point where we've gotten rid of enough of that sea ice that it's going to be really hard for it to recover now. We haven't just been seeing changes in the extent of the Arctic sea ice, but also in terms of its thickness as well. A lot of this information on changes in the Arctic sea ice thickness come from submarine data. Basically, if you remember, some of you may remember back to 1958 when the Nautilus was the first nuclear submarine to travel under the Arctic Ocean. Well, one of the things it was doing, it had an upward-looking sonar on it because they didn't want to impact with that ice. They wanted to make sure they were deep enough. Also, if they got into trouble, they wanted to be able to surface in an area that was thin ice. Well, since that, there's been a lot of other submarine cruises through the Arctic, all of them carrying this upward-looking sonar. A lot of this was Cold War legacy. Uh, for example, in the 1980s, the, the Russians found out they could hide from our submarines under the Arctic pack ice uh, because it was noisy. Uh, and so there was a lot of activity there. Well, a lot of this data has now been released for scientific inquiry. So what I'm doing here is comparing ice thickness collected by submarine sonar data for two periods, 1958 to 1976, call that the earlier period, and for 1993 to 1997, the later period. And what we can see, this is comparing the earlier period in the blue and the red being the later period. And what you can see, this is for different areas of the Arctic Ocean, a rather marked decline. Just for example, look at this one here, which is basically the North Pole. For that earlier period, that average ice thickness was around three and a half meters. Now we come back later, it's down less than two and a half meters. Okay? So we're not just losing the extent of ice, but it appears that the thickness of that ice is decreasing as well. Uh, just to go back here, there are some positive benefits to things like this, okay? this loss of sea ice. For example, opening of the northern shipping route. In 2005, you could have taken a ship fairly easily in the summer, right from Tokyo, across the Arctic Ocean along the Siberian coast, right into uh, uh, Murmansk or uh, you know, any kind of port in the Atlantic. Okay? Uh, the Russians are looking at this carefully because it could be an economic boom to them, okay? opening of, of this northern shipping route. But there's other costs as well. One of them is coastal erosion. What's happened is that as we reduce this ice extent and start to pull it back from the shore, what it means is that now the winds have a much longer fetch over open ocean areas, over open water. So you can start to develop a lot of wave action. Well, it turns out there are entire villages in areas of coastal Alaska and coastal Siberia that are either having to be or will have to be evacuated soon because the very coast they live on is being clawed away by this increased wave action. What exacerbates this problem locally, at least, is the loss of the permafrost. Permafrost, basically, it's that frozen soil. We can think of it as kind of a glue which holds that soil together. Well, in some areas now, we're really starting to lose that permafrost. So you've got increased wave action as well as you're losing that glue. Okay? 
So in other words, we're getting a lot of coastal erosion. This is kind of just a before and after shot. I believe this is from Point Barrow, Alaska, just showing some of those effects. Now what's been happening in the Arctic temperature-wise? Okay, Go back to the temperature problem. This is an analysis of temperature trends for the period 1971 through the year 2000 for winter, spring, summer, and autumn. Now basically this is looking at temperature trends in degrees per decade. Now all you have to worry about is anywhere that's in the yellows to the reds and purples is where temperatures have been rising. Um, anywhere in the greens is basically where it has been a cooling. Now also you see over the Arctic Ocean we don't have coverage in this particular figure. I'll talk about the Arctic Ocean in a minute. Well what you can see here is in any season the uh, those yellows and the reds are certainly dominating. The Arctic is warming strongly. We compare this to the global temperature record, we find that the warming, the recent warming in the Arctic over the past several decades has certainly been considerably higher than the global average. Okay? Arguably, it's arguing, Arctic amplification is starting to happen. Right? But the warming clearly is not uniform. Uh, we look at winter when the changes in temperature have been especially strong in the Arctic, especially here over Siberia and over northern North America. But we see areas where it's been cooling, especially in spring, for example, strong cooling out here. Okay? But overall, a pattern of warming, and this warming appears to be there in all seasons. It's not just re associated with one season, it's, a, it's there throughout the year, although certainly stronger in winter and spring. This is another view of the temperature changes. This is based on satellite data, okay, clear sky satellite retrievals. This one extends from 1981 through 2005. Uh, it didn't quite come out as clearly as I'd like, but here's Greenland out here. Okay? Here would be um, Alaska, and here's Siberia. Now in this plot here, anything in the yellows through those purples is where it has been warming over this period. And so you can see clearly the pattern is, again, associated with an overall pattern of warming. It covers both the land areas and the Arctic Ocean as well. What are these areas here, for example, where we've got a lot of red, in other words, indicating strong warming? Those are areas where we know we've lost a lot of the sea ice cover. So I talked about this idea of a feedback. Okay? What's happening here, apparently in part, is that we're losing this sea ice cover, okay? And so we're exposing that warm ocean water underneath. And so we're getting a lot of strong changes in the surface air temperature. In other words, it's arguing that at least locally we're starting to see some of these feedback effects. But what it also shows you is the, important of, the importance of variability in climate, temporal variability, natural variability in the system. Look over here in Siberia. That's sort of in these grays and, and greens. It's saying in this analysis in winter, actually large parts of Siberia are actually cooling Okay, in this analysis, which goes from 1981 through 2005. Let's just go back to this one. This one was saying, well, if we look at 1971 through 2000, okay, it was actually warming. So what's happening here? Well, it's telling us that the temperature trends that we get in the Arctic are very sensitive to the exact period of record that you choose. The reason for that is natural variability in the climate system. Just like in Utah, you might have a string of winters which are colder than another string of winters or warmer than another string of winters. You see the same thing in the Arctic. And in fact, this interannual variability, this natural variability in the system is actually rather strongly expressed in the Arctic. This is just one more figure that shows the temperature changes. This is showing it by latitude, so 30 degrees north to 90 degrees north, and by year. Okay, so 1890 through the late 1990s. Anything in the reds is where it was warmer than average, and in the blues where it was cooler. So look here at the high latitudes. We can see that from 1890 through about 1920, we were fairly cool. Then we got a rather strong warming pattern from the 1920s to the 1940s. We cooled off a bit, and now we see a very strong warming that is certainly appears to be of much larger extent, and in fact part of a global signal. What were we seeing here? This warming here was really isolated to the Arctic. Compared to this pattern here, the more recent years, clearly much stronger a part of a global signal. So what we're saying is the Arctic is certainly variable, okay, but overall temperatures have increased. So where does that variability come from? 
Well, it comes from a lot of different processes, but one of the strongest is something we call the North Atlantic Oscillation. It's a key player in high latitude warming, in recent high latitude warming. What it is, it's a large scale mode of atmospheric variability and it describes a correlation between two centers of action in the Atlantic atmospheric circulation called the Icelandic low and the Azores high. Here, this is the Icelandic low. It's a semi-permanent area of low pressure in the Arctic. As we know, winds tend to be counterclockwise against around low pressure systems. Then we've got this Azores high out here. Circulation in the atmosphere tends is, is, is uh, clockwise around highs. So you've got counterclockwise here, clockwise here, in between, you've got an egg beater effect. Okay? Well, what happens is that when this North Atlantic oscillation is strongly positive, this egg beater effect is stronger. In other words, this guy's strong, this guy's strong, the egg beater effect is stronger, and it pumps a lot of heat into the Arctic. And that actually has contributed to some of the patterns of warming that we've seen. The negative mode of this North Atlantic oscillation has op opposing signals, roughly. In other words, this guy here is weaker, and the Azores high is weaker. The egg beater is not as strong. You don't pump as much heat into the Arctic. Well, it turns out the NAO, there's different names for it. You can call it the uh, northern annular mode. Some people have a name for it, the Arctic oscillation. They're pretty much the same thing. But basically, just look at this top one here. Starting in about 1970, extending through the mid-1990s, this NAO went from basically a negative mode into a strongly positive mode. That helps to explain some of that warming that we saw in the Arctic. And certainly, the strong warming over Siberia is strongly associated with that change. Interesting thing, though, is since about the mid-1990s, that North Atlantic Oscillation has actually turned back to a neutral state. In other words, we don't have that big egg, egg beater effect working anymore to pump the heat up into the Arctic. Yet the Arctic still warms and the sea ice still retreats. This is just showing another pattern of temperature change from what we call the NSEP reanalysis. It's showing the pattern of temperature trends for the polar cap, average 70 to 90 degrees north, for the surface and for 925 millibars, roughly 3,000 feet above the surface. We can see a lot of variability. We go to the mid-1990s, that North Atlantic Oscillation kind of shut down, it went back to neutral. Do we see the Arctic recovering to cooler conditions? No. The Arctic has continued to warm strongly. Here's 2005, that's the last one here, sticking out like a sore thumb. So the warmest we've seen in the Arctic was 2005. It's a very interesting year, 2005. This is showing the temperature anomalies in 2005 relative to this base period, 1979 to 2004, from the surface up to the stratosphere. Okay, so this is surface, this is going way up in the atmosphere. This is by latitude. Anything in the greens and yellows and reds is where the temperatures were above normal. So if we look at mid latitudes, 40 degrees to 90 degrees north, we see as we move north, Okay. The temperature anomalies got more strongly and strongly positive. And look at the reds over the Arctic at the lower level, bullseye. Okay. So if we talk about the record warmth, the record 2005 temperatures globally, okay, it was very strongly an Arctic signal. What about the climate model projections? This is projections from five different climate models participating in the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment. This is looking at annual temperature changes projected in the Arctic, the year 2000 through the year 2100. What we see is that the different models all give somewhat different realizations. Okay, some are saying the Arctic will warm more. Some would say the Arctic will warm a little bit less. Okay, but they're all saying the Arctic is certainly going to warm rather strongly. Look at that sawtooth pattern. What's that sawtooth pattern? That's the natural variability in the system. Okay. These climate models have natural variability in them, just like the real world does, okay. which is good because they're supposed to simulate how the real world works. Okay. So we see this strong variability, just like we do in basically the observed system. Very briefly, this is showing an average of these five models, taking these five models and averaging them together. And we're saying, all right, we're going to ask ourselves, what's the, what's the change in air temperature over the period 2040 to 2059, not too far from now, compared to present day conditions. Anything in the reds and yellows is where warming occurs by averaging those five models. What you see, of course, is that's all yellow and red. Arctic is warming. 
Where do you see the big signal? Arctic Ocean. Arctic Ocean, that's where the biggest change is projected. And that has to do with this feedback, because what we're going to be doing is reducing that sea ice, exposing that warm open ocean, okay, causing a feedback process, pumping lots of heat into the atmosphere from that ocean area back in, back up. So that's where we really see the big signal. Right? Now, we don't see that today, but are we getting there? It appears that we are. This is taking some of these same climate models and uh, breaking them down individually. So in other words, the one I showed before was taking the five models and averaging them together. This is taking the five separately. And what do we see? Well, and, and also important, this is showing the projected changes for present, okay, we can call 1980 to 1999 present. And then we're looking at these with respect to projected changes for the year 2010 through 2029. In other words, an emergent greenhouse signal, something that we're arguably going to see rather soon. So we're talking, you know, a decade or two from now. What are these guys saying? Where are we going? What you see is the different models give different projections. This one here, this was from the Hadley Center, it's a British model. This is showing a lot of red. This one is saying that the strong, there's going to be especially strong warming, even, say, 15 years from now, over the Arctic Ocean as we begin to draw that sea ice back and initiate that feedback. This one here, this is an NCAR model, okay, from where I'm at in Boulder. This model's a little less sensitive. It's saying it's not going to quite warm up as much, and we don't really see that Arctic Ocean signal so strongly. This one here is intermediate. All these different models give somewhat different realizations. They're all certainly saying it's warming. What are they also showing? They're saying it's not warming uniformly everywhere as well. It's also cooling in some areas. See these green areas? And any of these models actually have green areas. That's where there's projected cooling. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing basically a general ramping up of temperatures, but we're also seeing what's, meant, what's superimposed on this is these effects of natural variability in the climate system. Things like the North Atlantic Oscillation that can kind of jump around and show oscillations, <laughs> give you warming and cooling patterns, okay? But this is all superimposed upon a general warming pattern. My take on the problem, if we compare the observed changes in the Arctic against what these climate models are projecting, we seem to be on the right trajectory, if you can think of that as a, a right trajectory, a rather sad trajectory in the sense that there is agreement there. Observations show a warming Arctic with strong imprints of natural climate variability. We are starting to see strong losses of that Arctic sea ice cover. We are starting to see strong changes in temperature over the Arctic Ocean in areas where we know that the sea ice has been reduced. Models, basically, they show the same thing. Okay, we're on the right trajectory. Caveat, records are short. Our records of climate in the Arctic, many of them are surprisingly short. Okay, so it's very hard sometimes to be able to separate out the effects from, of an anthropogenic cause change from natural variability in the system. Wild cards in the system. Greenhouse gases affecting the North Atlantic Oscillation. I talked about that North Atlantic Oscillation, which is a strong player in variability in the Arctic, and that it was responsible for a considerable part of the warming that we saw in this earlier period. Well, there's a number of climate model simulations are saying that if we actually change the atmospheric composition, we can actually bump this North Atlantic Oscillation into this positive mode, which gives you that strong egg beater effect, which even gives you a warmer Arctic. Okay? So we can't, we can't separate out the effects of changes in the atmospheric circulation from a direct anthropogenic effect. Another wild card, stability of the Greenland ice sheet. Is that ice sheet quite as stable as we think? It's an area of immense controversy right now. A great many people working on this. And I think the next 10 years are really going to be telling in terms of the stability of that Greenland ice sheet. And I think with that, we'll end it. And if there are any questions, thank you. Oh, I guess I guess time for one. Yeah.
Right. And mid-latitudes where it's showing zero change, and that's just when it's repeated. Oh, yeah, no, I, I don't know. Um, I, I can't, it might be hard to go back. But no, I don't know why it wasn't. Yeah, in mid-latitudes, actually in 2005, from the surface right up to the stratosphere, there just wasn't much change. Uh, the changes that you saw in the northern hemisphere was certainly in the higher latitudes. What you had is strong tropospheric warming, especially near the surface, and interestingly, stratospheric cooling. But, you know, why did, it, in those, those lower mid-latitudes and tropics, did you not see that change? I don't know. Well, I don't, my understanding of it, I'm not really a hurricane person, uh, but uh, I'm not, it's not clear to me that the North Atlantic Oscillation and uh, hurricanes are strongly linked, although I'm not the person to uh, comment on that. I mean, I know this whole idea of the hurricanes and increasing in their intensity and strength, that is a area of, well, vibrant controversy, I think is the most uh, adept way to put it. Uh, but uh, in terms of the North Atlantic Oscillation, there may be some link there, but I'm not aware that it's a strong link, but um, I could be corrected on that one. Well, the thing is, any of that sort of cooling that you get from, say, a, a slowdown of the thermohaline circulation, it would have to be a temporary effect. I mean, basically, because it's working in opposition to the sign of the greenhouse warming. In other words, you put a lot of fresh water on the surface, for example, and slow down the thermohaline circulation and cause some regional cooling. It could only be temporary. You know, maybe a few decades. Maybe Bill would have a different idea on that. But I think really only a few decades because it's in opposition to the large-scale forcing on the system. Quite different than something we got back, back during past glacial periods. So it's a very different bird today. Uh, yeah, yeah, there are, um, and the interesting thing is that we do not see as pronounced changes in the Antarctic as we do in the Arctic. Now, there are a number of reasons that that makes sense. One of them is that the atmospheric circulation looks very, very different. It's a much more zonal circulation, and it's harder to get these incursions of warm air into the high southern latitude like the North Atlantic Oscillation does in the Arctic. There are also some oceanographic arguments for that. Uh, there are some areas which are strongly warming, in particular the Antarctic Peninsula. And I believe the most recent indications from a paper that just came out in Science now is that the mass balance of the Antarctic ice sheet has turned negative. So, but yeah, the Antarctic has not changed as strongly as the Arctic. There are some reasons for that, but it is also a bit of a puzzle. <laughs>